Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. I'm going to take off my mask no matter how uncomfortable that makes me. So if you see me get a little squirmy, that's why. Um, really nice to be here. I'm a Canada Research Chair at Queen's. Uh, I'm an Associate Professor and I do a number of different things. I work with the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, which I'll talk about a little bit. And I'm also an affiliate uh, member for the Vector Institute and I'm really pleased to give the Sedgwick uh, lecture today. And Laurie and I are also uh, uh, alumni of the same uh, graduate program. So some disclosures, so I, I do get funding from the Tri-Councils and I'm also a, a, a charter member of the study section and I receive some uh, salary support for that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my lab today. Um, we do a number of different things in my lab, so we do things that sort of straddle statistics and biostatistics as well as computer science. Um, we do things in methodology development and evaluation. All of my work is around medical data or healthcare data. Um, we do biomarker discovery and validation. We do a lot of work in releasing data publicly for crowdsource challenges and that type of thing. And then we also mine a lot of data for predictive and prognostic uh, purposes. And so, so the lab is currently uh, split between Kingston and New York City, and I'll tell you a little bit about my time in New York City. We have folks that are from computer science, we have folks that are from uh, health sciences, we have folks that are residents in medical school, medical students, uh, medical fellows. And that's because I think to do the really hard work and to do the problems that really require a lot of people to think about them, you need a number of different backgrounds to do that really well. And so I like to think that if people are really interested in, in joining the lab and joining the work, then I try to find something that, that fits them really well and fits their really unique experience. Uh, so my lab, I have two labs actually at Queen's because I'm a joint appointment. I'm in health sciences and I'm also in computer science. Um, so these are my nice, beautiful, big, empty labs during the pandemic. Um, they got all finished up during the pandemic and then we couldn't use them. This is our view of Lake Ontario from Botterill Hall, which is really nice. Every once in a while I get a visitor. It's a turkey vulture, and let me tell you, the first time I saw him, it scared the bejesus out of me. Um, I looked over, and you can see through his beak. He's got this little part of his beak that you can actually see through. Um, and I'm also a center director now, so we have a new center that we've just launched called the Center for Health Innovation, and it's a joint Kingston Health Sciences, which is our local hospital, and Queen's University Center. So we're, we're doing some cool things there, and we have our lab meetings there. This, by the way, is entirely a talk to recruit you to graduate school if you're a student, so that's why these slides exist. So if you come to Queen's, this is the kind of, kind of environment you can work in. So just as, as background, so I actually did my undergrad at Trent in math and CS, and actually I know Jane Heffernan, her name was said a few times today because we, uh, we did our same degrees together at the same time and graduated at Trent. And then I graduated in 2009 from Queens in the CS PhD program. Um, I went down to Vanderbilt to do a postdoc in Nashville, Tennessee. Everybody always asks me, why did you go to Nashville? And it's because a girl's got to eat and there weren't really any openings for me here. So I went down to Nashville and took a postdoc there. Um, in 2012, Vanderbilt sent me to New York City to work at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center to lead a big grant that they had. Um, and then Sloan Kettering invited me to join the faculty in 2015. And then I came back to Canada in July of 2019, just before the pandemic, to open my lab there. So, so Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, you know, as a Canadian, I didn't know much about it, but it's, it's uh, a preeminent cancer center in the United States and worldwide. And I was a faculty member as a computational biologist because they actually don't know what a computer scientist is there and they don't know the difference between computational biology, bioinformatics and computer science. I'm sure most of you have some idea of that. So I was actually a computational biologist and I was within a clinical group. So I worked with MDs all day long. And I was also a professor at Weill Medical College, which was our medical school across the street. So I had this experience being really integrated with people doing clinical work. As a classically trained computer scientist, I also had a degree in math, right? So very much at the background of a lot of the students that are in the room today. And then went to a cancer center, learned a lot about health, learned a lot about medicine, and learned how to adapt my skill set into that space. Um, so Memorial Sloan Kettering has, a, has an interesting background that you might not be aware of. So they were the first collaborator of IBM Watson. So they were the first ones that signed on to IBM Watson. Um, and it, IBM Watson was meant to be this AI that was essentially your oncologist. 
and it really never panned out that way. And, and Watson's really considered to be an attempt, but, but largely a failure. You know, billions of dollars went into this thing, um, and I can tell you stories about why it doesn't work, but, but that's just to say that that's one area that the hospital had tried to invest in artificial intelligence very early on. And then the other thing that happened while I was there as a faculty member is that there were a series of articles that came out in the New York Times. And I can tell you that you don't want your institution to be featured in the New York Times because it is never a good thing. And it was because the hospital, um, one of the clinical groups was selling off data to, to an AI company. And the clinical groups were also sitting on the board of that AI company, had an, a fiduciary responsibility to them, and were also receiving payment as board members. And so that's why at the beginning of my talk, I put my conflicts of interest in, because in artificial intelligence, the conflicts of interest are extremely, extremely deep. There are a lot of people working in ways with companies that we don't understand. And that's why it's really important to me to be very forthcoming with where I receive funding from. And that's why I don't really take any money from companies. Um, so I have this perspective. So I was on the faculty in the United States at a really high volume cancer center. That meant that people came there to receive their cancer treatment, right? So you come to Memorial Sloan Kettering because you already have cancer. We know you have cancer. So we're gonna do things like sequence you. We're gonna, gonna take samples from your biopsy. We're gonna genomic sequence you. We're going to, um, we're gonna image you with radiology imaging many, many times. So we're going to get very, very deep data on you. Um, and I also had a really great integration there with the biostatistics group. So I, I always joked that I had like a little mini fellowship in biostats. Um, and we really, we, we understood the need for data science, right? The need for computer science and statistics to come together in a single discipline of data science because I think data science is the thing that makes AI better um, and we need to do that together. So now I'm uh, part of the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. You probably don't know about it because hopefully you've not had cancer, but if you had cancer in Canada and you wanted to be enrolled on a clinical trial, which I can assure you that is something you'd wanna do, you would be involved in one of the trials that they run. So they coordinate cancer trials across Canada. But the interesting thing from a data side is that we centralize all the specimen that's collected from all the patients on all the trials. So every little bit of specimen comes into Queens, we take pictures of it, we accession it, and we put it in our biobank, right? So then all the data that's surrounding you as someone in that cancer trial is also in that data repository. So now we've got this experience in a high volume cancer center, super deep data. We have this experience being part of the cancer trials group where we're getting a broad amount of data that's specific to certain cancer trials all within a repository. And then another thing that I'm pretty deeply involved in is the Ontario Health Data Platform, which was something that the government of Ontario launched during the pandemic to try to take advantage of, of uh, uh, data at a population level. So to make population level types of analyses. And we saw there, were, there was one talk today that had some population level data in it from Medicare. So that's when you're looking at not so much data, not su such deep data as a cancer center, but a little bit of data about billing across all different people in the province. So 14 million Ontarians. And then every time that they've hit the the hospital system, or the hospital plus primary care, you know, every time you go see your family physician, that all sits within this. Um, and so that's looking at data from a lot of different perspectives, right? And that gives you sort of a perspective of the types of things you could do across, you know, what you would do with 14 million patients where you don't have a lot of deep data versus 100 patients where you have extraordinarily deep data. Those are all very different techniques. And so a lot of our work in the lab is actually based on uh, imaging. So this is a, a radiology image. This is a computed tomography scan, a CT scan of the abdomen. So this is your liver. Where'd my little mouse go? Oh yeah, now I lose my mouse. Okay, there we go. That's your liver. Okay, and so if you zoom in on that a lot, this is what your liver looks like. Can you see that okay? I could turn the lights down. We meant to turn the lights down. Lori, we forgot to turn the lights down. Two PhDs in computer science, what do you know? So, so look, this picture and the pattern of pixels in this liver, this is information, right? And historically, we have not used this information for computation, and now we know how to do this. So we can actually, oh, really? Oh, excellent. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm sorry, world. Oh, 
I've lost it. Come on, baby. I, I shouldn't have said anything. That's what we've learned here. That's the lesson. Okay, everybody. Oh, it's doing something. Yes! PhD in computer science. There we go. Um, so this is information. We can mine this information and we can use it to do things like predict whether or not you're going to respond to chemotherapy. We could predict whether or not you'll respond to immunotherapy and other advanced therapies, and we can use this to try to guide your care. And that's pretty much what underpins a lot of the work that we do in our lab. We also have started working with population data and other things. This is kind of the bread and butter of what we do. And so um, a lot of what we do is thinking about standardization. So everybody goes to a different hospital, gets a different scan. So how do we make sure that these biomarkers, we call them biomarkers, they're things that tell you tell us what to do with you when you're in the clinical system. Um, how do we take those biomarkers? So first of all, how do we discover them? So we do a lot of discovery. But once you discover it, how do you make sure that that biomarker is actually going to re be reproducible and repeatable or robust across multiple institutions and that kind of thing? Multiple different imaging modalities, uh, making sure that it works for everyone equally. And then we, we can evaluate and then attempt to implement them. So, so we do a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, so this is an example of a, of, so this is uh, two time points of the same patient. So, so before treatment at the top and after treatment at the bottom, this is a patient with cholangiocarcinoma, which is a really rare biliary cancer. This is uh, intrahepatic, meaning it happened in the liver. And so we gave this person uh, this really fancy chemotherapy that we deliver through uh, hepatic arterial infusion, which means that we literally put tubes into your liver and we send chemotherapy into it. It's kind of crazy, but it works really well. And so we can predict using imaging and using quantitative imaging who is going to respond to this type of therapy. And so we've, we're studying that pretty extensively. These are patients that have pretty bad outcomes. So to be able to um, uh, give, them, give them more options while they're on Earth is really important to us. Um, we also do some work in pancreatic cancer. So one of the things that happens to people is that they go to get, um, you know, a scan for something. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe you got hit really hard by a baseball. I don't know. You have to go, you have to get a scan for something. And you have what we call an incidental finding in your pancreas. And that incidental finding, so not something that anybody was looking for, suggests that you might have changes to your pancreas that could put you at high risk for pancreas cancer. Pancreas cancer is the most aggressive cancer that there is. It's uniformly fatal. At five years, about 10% of patients live. And so for us to be able to find patients at an earlier time point from these incidental findings that we can completely remove a potential cancer is a really big deal. Turns out we can do that with quantitative imaging pretty early. Now, whether or not somebody has an actual scan that we can use it from is a different matter. But we've shown that we can actually do that. You can take the information, and honestly, you can even look at these pictures. It all comes down to, okay, where's my mouse now? Oh, you are dis okay, my mouse doesn't want to do it. It comes down to, if you see where these arrows are, the shape of, of what that blob looks like. And after you stare at those blobs for a really long time and you look at enough of them, which is what a radiologist does, and they're trained to understand them, but you can do the same thing with a computer. You can train a computer to do it. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of stuff that we do. Um, but um, a lot of what we know about cancer, we know um, because of clinical trials. So you get diagnosed with cancer, we'll put you on a clinical trial. Um, but clinical trials are a bit limited because they have inclusion and exclusion criteria to make sure that the chemotherapy that's being tested is optimally beneficial in that, in that, in that patient population. So that means that in the general population, we don't know how chemotherapy works. We don't know how well it works. We only know within these very specific, tightly controlled clinical trials how well that therapy works. And what we want to know is how well it works in everybody, right? Because then that would tell us about the uh, uh, efficacy of that. Um, and so this has kind of gotten into the idea of, of real-world evidence in medicine. 
And from a computational standpoint, it means basically how can you look at population level data and look at cancer? Um, instead of working at this very you know, specific silos of data of cancer patients, how can you look across all of it? Um, and start to understand, you know, can you develop new medical treatments, new chemotherapies, that kind of thing. Um, and so, so real world evidence is this idea of, of taking complementary sources of evidence that can better capture treatments used in routine care, so not just clinical trials, um, and outcomes that are most meaningful to patients. And so the idea of real world evidence is that, you know, you can take in data from wearables. I mean, this is the pie in the sky idea. Honestly, this doesn't really exist right now, right? Like that you could take mortality data and pharmacy data, hospital data, you know, your census data, all of this kind of stuff and put it in, you know, stir it up in the pot of AI and it magically tells you something. This is the pie in the sky. It really doesn't exist because our data is not formatted well enough to do this kind of stuff, but it's, it's what, we, what we'd like to do. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is, um, can we use AI to solve, oh, I missed a word. Okay, don't look at that. Uh, can we use AI to solve fundamental cancer problems? I know, they gave me a Canada Research Chair. Can you believe that? Um, don't tell them. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about image segmentation. Then I'll talk about some natural language processing and, and whether or not we can use that to solve cancer pro problems. Are you going to play? There we go. So the object recognition problem. So the object recognition problem, which most of you probably know, is given an image, determine what's in that image. It was unsolved for decades. You know, the, the story is that Marvin Minsky gave this to one of his students, gave it to an undergrad for their summer project. He thought it would take four months and it took many decades. This was the 1950s, I think. And it was solved recently. And it's what made self-driving cars a reality. It's what made my, I have a Prius and when I go over too far to one side, it goes beep, 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 beep. So it helped that happen, right? Um, so take an image, label everything in that image. And so open science solved that problem, right? It wasn't each of us working by ourselves in a room. It was all of us contributing to a big idea. Uh, the visual object classes 2012 competition was when it was really, when this solution was kicked off. Um, so the challenge was that given an image, determine what's in the image. And they did this with 10 million images with a thousand labels, um, a, sorry, a thousand labeled classes, so multiple labels within each class. And that created ImageNet. And ImageNet came along at around the same time as convolutional neural networks, right? And that's what really prope propelled artificial intelligence forward in sort of this new phase that we're in right now. And so we endeavored to do the same thing, but for medical images. And this started as a conversation. I was complaining actually at a conference about how, like I was walking around and I'm, you know, I was at a cancer center at the time and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, you know, people are just looking at the wrong problem or they don't have the right data set or they don't have you know, access to whatever it, it need, whatever it is they need to do really high quality, impactful work for cancer patients. Um, and so I agreed to share a lot of the data that we had collected and annotated. And so we assemble, assembled this group from, from all over the world actually to embark on uh, the medical segmentation decathlon. Um, and this was just published a couple of months ago in Nature Communications. And the segmentation decathlon just the amount of work that went into this thing and the amount of people that it needed just to get the darn thing off the ground, never mind all the people that actually participated in the challenge. Um, we launched it in 2018 and the idea was to develop a semantic segmentation algorithm that can solve segmentation tasks separately and without any human interaction. Um, and so your algorithm should be able to learn on unseen tasks. That was the big deal. So no human interaction and no retraining between, between. Um, and it's essentially an image net for medical images. And so we took data sets from the brain, from lung, liver, pancreas, et cetera, and, and then we had them split into training and test within each data set and then within the whole challenge. So there were a couple of tasks that were completely unseen in the, in the test. Um, and so, so the thing with image segmentation, so we're interested in a region of interest within the image and the way that we calculate whether or not that region of the image is correctly segmented. We use something called a, a dice 
coefficient, and that just measures the degree of overlap. And we use a gold standard, which is usually a radiologist goes through and circles whatever region of interest it is. And so we, uh, so that the top performing team, it was, it was pretty amazing, um, achieved state-of-the-art performance across almost every data set within the, these 10 tasks. And that was the first time that this concept of generalizability had been shown in medical imaging. And the idea that you could really train an algorithm to unseen tasks. Um, and this this uh, was this algorithm was actually just public. Actually, it was published before the challenge was even published. It was published last year, and it's the current state of the art in the field. Um, and that uh, you know that data is publicly available now. It spawned um, you know a big part of Clara, which is Nvidia's healthcare toolkit. Um, so it, it's within their SDK. You can download it within in that. You can download it from the medical decathlon website. Um, it was used to launch Monai, which is a new commercial product, um, and it launched this, uh, this was the method I was telling you about. This is the current standard in our field, and has been since it, it came out in 2018. Nobody's really beat it. They've made, made some small improvements, but nothing that really propelled us forward to the degree that this did. And this was all because we came together to work at something. Where I had the data, you know, we put it available, there were other people that, that contributed other parts of you know, the organization of, of the contest. Um, you know, doing grand challenges is super hard. It's super hard to get the data, to get all the contracts done so you can release the data. Just, getting, just releasing the data is a pain. And then you know, how do you figure out if somebody won the challenge? It turns out that's actually really hard because if you don't have a winner, that's a problem. If the winner is, is just you know, slightly eking ahead of somebody else, well, how do you know? What if there was just a segmentation issue in one of the challenges, sub-challenges, so how do you know if somebody really won? So we put a lot of effort into thinking about that. And that took, a, a, took 10 institutions to figure all that out. Um, there's, this has also led to new challenges, so you, you've probably learned of federated learning. So federated learning is the concept that you keep the data local, but you move the model around. So you move the weights around from institution to institution. So we've done, done some of that. So we had uh, the FETS, the Federated Tumor Segmentation Challenge, last year and this year. Um, and this was run by UPenn, by uh, Nature uh, uh, Spiros Bacchus at UPenn. Um, and yes, like many institutions involved in this federated learning challenge. It's like I've never seen so many people listed on a journal paper. Um, but you know what? It sh showed that federated learning works and that you can get a better result by doing it this way. I will tell you it's not for the faint of heart. You need, you know, multiple engineers to actually get one of these pipelines up and running, but you can actually do it. Um, so, so it was really cool to see, you know, how we can work together um, and yet maintain some of the policies around data sharing that, that individual institutions have. So that's a really great paper to take a look at too. So we talked about image segmentation. So this is a pretty foundational problem in the field of medical image analysis. And I think over the next you know, five years, well, I think right now, there's a certain amount of image segmentation that's now a solved problem for medical imaging. And uh, I'm pretty confident saying that. And I think we can start translating it to some of the, the really needed clinical problems uh, and clinical applications. So now we're going to switch to talking about natural language processing. So um, this is the, uh, one of the papers that we wrote on this that you can take a look at. Um, and it's really, you know, it's this concept that data is king. And, you know, a lot of data is king, right? Everybody wants a lot of data. Um, and so we endeavored to develop a cancer digital twin. Um, and a cancer twin, I don't know if you've heard about this. So this is the idea that you can have a digital replica of someone. That's the digital twin concept. And in cancer, so you could use that digital twin, that cancer digital twin, to uh, do things like experiment with uh, types of chemotherapy and that kind of thing. So if you took all the information available about a given pa patient, so this goes back to the real world medicine concept, and you could put it all into a digital twin, then you could try different treatments. And then you wouldn't have to run a clinical trial because you could do it all digitally. Um, and so we endeavored to attempt to build a uh, a cancer digital twin by using natural language processing and imaging uh, to create a map of disease burden for machine learning purposes. Um, and so we created a database, and I'll, maybe I'll just tell you a little bit about that database. 
But taking a step back, because you have to understand a little bit about how we, um, how we, uh, when we have a cancer patient, how do we figure out if that patient has responded or not to chemotherapy? Well, it's pretty simple. We look at their imaging, and if their tumor has shrunk, they've responded. If their tumor has gotten bigger, they've not responded. And then there's a stable disease, which is somewhere in the, in the middle of all that. So this was actually, this was invented at Queen's actually, and it revolutionized cancer. And the reason is that oncologists needed a reliable, reproducible measurement of response. And so this, these are published rules, so these are accepted by the community. It's called RESIS, Response Evaluation Criteria in Small, Solid Tumors. It's done by the radiologist, and it's documented separate from what they do in their clinical activities. So meaning that this is only available on clinical trials. So this is highly detailed analysis that's only done on clinical trials, which is why we only know how cancer drugs work on trial and we don't really understand how they work off trial. Um, and this all, guess what, is a segmentation problem. So this is how you do uh, resist. Um, you take the, the largest tumor, you measure the diameter in 2D on, on what you think is the biggest slice of the tumor in imaging. And then you do that at other time points throughout their care. And you measure the difference, and then you use that to categorize uh, stable progression, uh, partial or complete response. So it's, you can imagine that it's extremely time consuming, right? Like a radiologist just doesn't have time to go through and annotate every single scan. If you consider that a cancer patient, you know, they're getting a new scan every two to four weeks, right? And so again, that's only, on patients on trial, right? So we only understand how those drugs work actually on trial, which means if we release a drug in the general population, we actually, we don't measure how it works and we kind of don't care and the companies don't care that make these drugs. Um, and so Sloan Kettering, where I used to work in New York, um, I, I still have lots of really great collaborators there. Uh, they have 700,000, well, it's actually over a million now, but let's say 700,000 structured radiology reports that go back to 2009. So on the left-hand side here, the text that you see, those are example, that's an example report that a radiologist creates. And it's structured, so they get help creating it by a computer. So it pops up with different pull-down menus that the radiologist can use. And um, they have, uh, down the, the left-hand side, those are all of the different organs. Um, and basically what a radiologist is interested in is documenting whether or not your cancer has metastasized. So remember, in cancer terminology, you've got a primary cancer, that's your first cancer, and then all your subsequent cancers are metastatic. So that's, that's what we call metastatic disease. And so these organs that go down the side here, those are all sites of metastases. So those are sites of cancer. And so basically you have this really pretty structured report that, that contains information for each of these organs. And then you can take that out, you can suck it out, and you can put it into a nice table for each of the organs and whether or not they have metastases. And that corresponds to an image. And what this gets you around to do analysis of just the reports is that I don't have to suck in this big image and deal with it, I can just look at the report. And so this is our approach, right, to doing artificial intelligence off, uh, across an entire population of patients, we can do it on just the report. Um, so again, so cancer patients get imaged all the time. This is our workhorse in, in healthcare is to image people. So that means that we have many, many time points of data, we have uh, treatments, we have demographics that are happening to these, oh, Siri's trying to help me. Don't help me, Siri, thank you. Um, across time, very, very rich information, right? And it's because we have access to these reports. And so what we did, um, we wanted to be able to study these reports, so of course, we had to label all these reports. So this is that weekly supervised approach where you go through and you get the computer to label everything, but first you have to train the computer on how to label. So we took a subset of reports and we had radiologists annotate them and we made, made this, uh, on the right, we made this nice little um, interface for them so they could actually annotate the reports. It popped them up automatically and then they had a little pull down menu and this helped us 
apply those ground, tooth, ground truth annotations. And then uh, we use that, so that was just a subset, right, of all the data, and we use that um, to train a, an NLP to actually label all the reports. Um, so we did that, and that worked out really, really well. And then we took that and we used that on all the reports. Originally, 400,000 reports. Now we've got over a million, um, and we've got labels for all these reports. So imagine that we have for, I think it's about 60,000 patients, so 60,000 patients, you know, could be up to 15 reports each that really measures for them or demonstrates for them or maps maybe is the best word, their progression over time. And um, yeah, so we take this final NLP, we run everything through it so we get this very nice map. And so then we can start looking at metastases uh, uh, and their distribution by primary cancer site. So on the left-hand side, that's a list of all the primary cancer sites. And then going out, those are all the, the metastases or all the secondary cancers that everybody's getting off of these primary cancers. And again, this is off of you know, 60,000 patients. You could not annotate this by hand, right? It would be virtually impossible. And if I talk to my medical colleagues, you know, they talk about, you know, when I was a fellow and I had to go down to the basement and I had to flip through all of the charts by hand, all of the paper charts, we could study 100 patients because that's, that's the maximum that I could go through. Well, then we computerized things, but you still had to manually go through electronic charts. So then that got to be 1,000 patients, and we kind of topped out there. Like, if you look at, at clinical papers, they tend to be on about 1,000 patients or maybe, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 or maybe 3,000 if you had a really keen medical student that wanted to review 3,000 charts. Um, so what this is letting you do is really suck in all of that data and do a population level analysis. Um, and then you can do things like look at patterns of metastatic spread within specific cancers. So this is just three examples, prostate, colorectal, and pancreas cancers, and how the combinations of these metastases happen. Um, and so now I'm going to turn to how we can use that to solve now that we can take those two ideas, this image segmentation, this natural language processing of, of reports and put them together. And I could, I'm, I'm just going to give away the end. We're not done all this yet, so you're not going to see like that I've changed the world today. Um, but this is the kind of stuff we're doing right now. So this is a survival curve. I don't know if you learn survival in, in statistics in undergrad. I, you probably don't, but maybe you do. Um, but these measure essentially um, so we have survival probability on one axis and time. And so this is called time-dependent survival analysis, and this is how uh, we can um, look at how many patients have survived over time with censoring. Censoring is the concept of if you lose a patient to follow-up, you don't have to remove them from the analysis. You can keep them in the analysis, but you censor them. And so that's really important. Um, in machine learning a lot, we say, oh, well, that person was lost to follow-up, so we'll just exclude them from the analysis. And that's not correct, because that's going to give you a, a biased sample, right? If you're taking out a group of patients consistently, you don't want to do that. So, okay, so this is a survival curve. So if you're a patient, you want to be close to one, because that means you're alive, right? So, so you can see, okay, let me look at this screen. This might be better. So like 60-something percent uh, in M0, are alive at 11 and something months. That's what that means. So this is from a ground truth database that we had, um, where we had, um, so each of these letters, that's called staging, which is how, a, how a, um, a doctor and a pathologist define how advanced your cancer spread is. Um, that, that's called clinical staging. So that's this one, this is ground truth. And this is one that we did automatically. And you can see that they're actually pretty good. And this one actually separates the survival curves a little nicer, which is better, because then you can start treating these curves differently and giving people different therapies depending on which curve they're in. So that was really cool, because that meant that we could essentially, in real time, make a survival curve instead of having to manually review hundreds and hundreds or thousands of patients. Um, and then we had an oncologist uh, come, come to us and say, 
We think that in this one subset of melanoma patients, we think that they have this type of metastatic spread, but we don't know. And if we knew that, then we could target them with this other type of chemotherapy. So, so in real time, we just checked for them and we generated survival curves and we did it completely without manual curation so that they could then look at that and say, oh, these patients do have a different outcome. I should design a trial for these patients specifically. And that's what they did. And that's a really simple tool for us to make, right? It's just a, just a way to look at data. Um, and then we've also done, so Karen Batch, who was a, a master's student in the lab, she's graduated now and is making a lot more money than me, I'm sure, because um, that's what happens to students that know any kind of AI. Uh, did a really nice paper looking at uh, consecutive structured radiology reports and trying to take in consecutive reports and seeing if she could improve predictions. And, and of course, she could do that. So that's a really nice paper. Um, but there's, there's a lot of different things that we can do now that we have this information, right? Because now we have this automated image segmentation. So we can automate segmentation of a bunch of different organs, a bunch of different tumors, now we have what the label of that, that image should be because we've derived it from the structured radiology report. So we know to look for metastases that we want to segment. We know to look for a liver tumor that we want to segment. Um, so what we'd like to be able to do now is take the image, the, the raw imaging data and merge it with the reports so that we could look at true response to chemotherapy and things like that. And that's never been done before because it's, it, was just too intractable a problem before. You'd never be able to annotate that much data, and now we can because, um, because we've come so far because of crowdsource challenges and other advancements in the field. One of my PhD students is looking at, okay, so there's a proportion of patients that have what we call a cancer of unknown primary. So we can't figure out what their first cancer was, what their primary cancer was. So the problem with that, when that happens, so you know how we do uh, genomic sequencing and we figure out what genes you have and then we make a therapy based on that? Well, that only works if we know what your primary cancer is. If we don't know what your primary cancer is, your genes are meaningless to us, Me don't have any meaning and we can't actually create a target. And so what my student is trying to do is look backwards in time and take the subset of patients that are cancers of unknown primary that we have in this database, see if they can discern metastatic patterns, and then look back to see for the next patients that come in with a cancer of unknown primary if we can fit them to a primary. And that, that would be really cool. Um, but this is, this is interesting, right? It expedites questions that we want to ask in clinical research and generates hypotheses that we can, we can then analyze in clinical trials in controlled situations. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk, I'm just going to talk briefly about, uh, um, data in Ontario, because of course I'm from Ontario, and then you can, you can think about how this translates to your province. Um, so the, the thing with data and health data is that it's always been siloed, right? It's really siloed in the U.S. It's pretty siloed in Canada. So in Ontario, and I think you probably have the same here, we had a, we have a health card and it's a number that's assigned to us that goes with us everywhere we go. And that gives us the opportunity to have a database of all the patients and all of their related health data. Um, Ontario is a single payer insurance, which is OHIP, which is why we know why we have a number for everybody. Um, and so in response to COVID-19, the Ontario government launched uh, the Ontario Health Data Platform. It's, um, so it's a data platform and I'd never really experienced this to quite this degree before, although I guess maybe similar is the UK Biobank, where you actually log in to a federated secure environment and everything is there for you. It's a state-of-the-art environment. It's got all your tools that you wanna use as a data scientist or a computer scientist or statistician. Um, and the data is available to you. There are data dictionaries. There's uh, you know variable versioning, really state-of-the-art underlying it is a a high performance compute cluster so you can actually do things quickly. And all of that's located at Queen's. And interestingly, the Ontario government actually had to change PHIPAA regulations in the province, which is a little bit scary um, so that we don't need uh, um, uh, uh, ethics approval to do this kind of work. 
and that's because it's in a secure environment and I hope we're on the right side of history with how we're handling healthcare data. Um, and, and just, so I'm gonna start wrapping up here, but I wanted to bring your attention to a couple of different things. One is that um, I always thought that if we had enough data, we would do the, it would be perfect, right? Like if you just had enough data, you can make really accurate models and everything would be fine. It turns out a lot of medical data for black patients is adjusted in a process called race correction. And so there are laboratory values that black people get in routine clinical care that when they get their report back, it says adjusted for African-American status. And that's what it says on Canadian reports, by the way. Um, so they are taking laboratory values, which are measurements. So things like creatinine levels and they adjust it, meaning that, that black patients then do not qualify for kidney transplants, for other transplants, because their laboratory values are adjusted, so then by the time they come back and they're really not feeling good, now they're no longer eligible for transplant. And that pervades our healthcare system currently, and that is a process called race correction. That means that the data that we are working with is fundamentally incorrect. And that is something that a lot of people are working to undo right now, but the effect of that is deep and wide. And that's something we need to think about. And so I have a, 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 a postdoc, uh, Lana James, she does a lot of work in black public health, race correction, and artificial intelligence are, are two of her real um, passions. Um, and I guess what I've learned from Lana, oh, she did this great podcast for Stanford that I really recommend that you listen to. Um, and she talks about how the data are already biased. And so, you know, as AI scientists, we think we're doing this amazing work, but, you know, I have to tell you that this is, it's really scary times. Um, we also have another uh, postdoc that joined us recently, and she's a, an indigenous scholar and she specializes in decolonizing artificial intelligence and data. Um, and she's super interesting. So we have this really nice collaboration with Native Biodata Consortium, which is a group in South Dakota, an indigenous organization. And they are repatriating the data and specimen for all the indigenous folks in the United States so that it can be put within their own data platform so that they can have uh, self-determination because that's really important to indigenous populations. Um, and independence. And so, so Native Biodata Consortium is really interesting. So, so our new postdoc's name is Robin Rowe, and we're learning a, a lot from her about uh, Indigenous-led data governance and sovereignty. Um, and now we move into the recruiting segment. So if you're already a professor, you can go, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I want to highlight a couple of things for you. I get questions about this a lot. A lot of, a lot of students don't realize if you're in first, second, third year, in the end of January, the NSERC Undergraduate Student Research Awards, that's when the application deadline is. So if you want to go to grad school, if you think you want to do research, I really recommend that you get one of these NSERC USRAs. So that's, um, again, first, second, third year. Um, if you're in your fourth year and you're considering graduate school, I really recommend that you apply for an NSERC uh, uh, CGS, the deadline is December 1st. Even if you're not sure if you want to go to grad school, it's really a good idea to get an application in. I would also remind you that, um, so Queen's deadline is January 15th for grad school. The sooner you can get applications in, you know, typically with these programs, you're applying to a supervisor, you're not applying just to a program. So you need to find the supervisor and we can typically come in, like the way that it works at Queen's, I can just come in and say, okay, you're accepted. And that goes to a committee and the final acceptance happens, but that's just to let you know, not to let these deadlines get away from you, because the further you go into the year, and like by May, we kind of know everybody that we want to have in the lab and the money, you know, we only have so much money. So if you're really thinking about grad school, like start exploring it now and contact uh, potential supervisors. Um, okay, I'm wrapping up. So, so I've always thought of myself as kind of this bridge between a computational compu community, a data science, statistics, whatever, and a clinical community. I like to think I build bridges. I'm probably drowning in the water at the bottom, but I'm trying really hard. Um, 
And uh, lots of other folks to thank, like there is a whole world of, of, of fellows and students and folks that have done work in the lab previously. Um, and my colleague in New York, Richard Doe, who I do a lot of my work with. Uh, and with that, I will uh, take any questions. Thank you.